Hello, everyone. Hi, my name is Kristen. I'm the Visual Arts Program Manager at the Vermont Studio Center. Welcome, welcome to one of our virtual VSC events. Um, if you are not familiar with VSC, if you've not chimed into our virtual VSC, if you've not been here before, uh, we are located in Northern Vermont. Uh, we are a year round, typically, a year round residency program for visual artists and writers. Vermont Studio Center recognizes that it operates on land which has long served as a site of meeting and exchange among indigenous peoples for thousands of years and is the home of the Abenaki people. We honor, recognize, and respect these peoples as the traditional stewards of the lands and waters on which we gather. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. So our virtual artist tonight is Matt Neckers. Matt Neckers is a visual artist and teaching artist who works in a variety of media including sculpture, photography, painting, and installation. Matt's work has been featured in Hyperallergic, Art New England, Vermont Public Radio, The Whitefish Review, Seven Days, and Vermont Art Guide. In fact, Seven Days just posted a brilliant review yesterday. Take Magazine named Matt a 2017 artist to watch. Matt has received a creation grant from the Vermont Arts Council with funding from the National Endowment for the Arts for his Mobile Museum project, the Vermont International Museum of Contemporary Art and Design, which toured multiple locations in Vermont, including the Kent Museum, Abandoned Asbestos Mine, a remote pond, the Museum of Everyday Life, Burlington City Arts, the Fairbanks Museum, and Vermont Studio Center. He also created an interactive museum inside of a 1940s refrigerator, which was installed at the Fleming Museum in Burlington, Vermont in February of 2019. I can go on and on with all of Matt's accolades, but I'm gonna let him talk. So uh, without further ado, Matt, the floor is yours. Hey, thank you so much. Um, it's really exciting to be here. This is absolutely one of my favorite places on earth. Um, and, I, and I know a lot of you have been here before. So um, I'm really fortunate because I do live down the road and, um, and I was able to just sort of drive here. I'm in the gallery right now. Uh, wishing that a lot of you could be here with me. So I think what I'm gonna do right now is I'm gonna try sharing my screen. We'll see how this works um, and sort of jump into presentation here. So I thought I'd start one of the, the, the idea behind this show, realizing that, that people weren't going to be here in the same way that they might otherwise, but people are still driving by in their cars is to use the windows out in front and make this whole show viewable from the road. So it, it was, it's really intended to be viewed uh, from outdoors. Um, I know that the, the lights are on, I think, 24 hours a day right now. So anytime you drive by here, you can see this. Um, I use my own family as models in this. I made them pose inside the gallery to make it look like there were people inside in case you're wondering about the social distancing. Um, but anyway, uh, so this is the show. So this is actually an uh, image of the work in my studio. You're going to notice I, I'm a narcissist, so I put myself in a lot of these photos. Uh, but actually, it, part of the reason is just to show you the scale of it, because I think if you don't see a person or, or a thing in it, you're not going to understand just how big it is. Um, this is made out of combination of materials, but mostly um, those uh, rectangles in the background are made out of sheet metal, painted sheet metal. And almost everything that you see on the walls um, behind there is held on with magnets. So I, I actually picked a couple of them off the walls right now in the gallery, right? So little things that you can move around on the back. Um, and the idea of them is that this is an, an interactive exhibit, although with few people being allowed in the gallery, well, everybody's allowed the gallery, you just need to call Kristen and she'll let you in. But um, without that, uh, you know, I think it's, it's, there's less of that going on, but ideally that would be my intention for this project. So this is a, a shot in the Red Mill. I know a lot of you know the space well, so I'm not gonna, but just to give you an orientation, rather than try to walk around with the computer right now and, and show you everything, I thought this was easier. Um, some of the pieces are illuminated. Um, so I, I like playing with light and electricity. Um, and, and maybe I'll just talk a little bit about some of the, my intention or my meaning, the meaning behind it. I did this piece mostly between, I'd say about November and you know, middle of January of this year, um, when there were lots of things going on. Election was going on climate change is happening, you know, we're dealing with an insurrection, all that kind of stuff. And so, uh, you know, I, I see these as kind of, a, as, kind of as, a, as a time lapse of that time frame. So rather than being about any one particular day, I mean, there were so many strange and unusual things 
that happened during that time. And some of them definitely relate to uh, you know, a little bit more complicated imagery than just the playful colors. All right, so you can see that again. I don't know if I'm, going, I'm going backwards, I'm sorry. I get that right. Okay, and so what I thought I'd also talk about are, is maybe some similar work here. Um, these are not magnets, but this is in my studio. Um, sort of an assemblage, lots of different things, painting and whatnot. Again, I put myself in as a narcissist. Um, another one, right? You can see the scale of it. Um, so anyway, these are actually, and these things are, both of these are things that, that, you know, well, maybe parts of it have been seen at the studio center before in the gallery, but for the most part, it exists in my studio. And then I move on and do something else. So if anybody has a giant wall somewhere that they want to put something on, I have giant pieces of artwork that I'd be happy to loan you for an indefinite amount of time. Okay. Uh, the other thing I'm going to talk about, and I'll talk in more detail later, uh, but this was a project that I work on that worked on that that uh, nearly killed me. Uh, the Vermont International Museum of Contemporary Art and Design, um, and the basic idea was to come up with the most pretentious name that I could think of for an art museum, and then build it. And inside of this are I think about 15 galleries, hundreds of pieces of artwork. Most of them are 112 scale, so one one inch equals one foot basically. One foot equals one inch, whatever it is. I'm not a math person. Uh, so they're tiny little pieces of art inside of here. And I committed to do this project in a year, which was crazy. Um, and that's what nearly killed me. And I had to rehab the camper. Um, unlike the miniature artwork, this is a giant rocket. It's about, I think it's 11 feet long. It weighs about 400 pounds. It's made out of steel. I think a lot of people think when they first see it that maybe it's a model. Um, I'll talk about rockets and in, in, in the work. This was actually an installation at Real Artways in Hartford, Connecticut. If anybody's ever been down there, but they were kind enough to let me show work there about a year ago. Well, just before the pandemic. Okay. Oh, I'm going the wrong way again. All right. Um, I know that my dad's in the call, which probably means my mom is too, so I can't say anything terrible about my, ch about my childhood. Um, but I grew up in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and, and Grand Rapids, Michigan um, at the time was one of the first cities to install a large piece of uh, public sculpture, this stabile by Alexander Calder. And this was installed, I think, when I was probably maybe one year old. And, and I don't know that I ever really, I, I didn't identify it as art until much later. Uh, my dad's office was across the street from it. So really it was kind of a piece of furniture. And I didn't realize until much later how it impacted my creative process. Okay, this is a picture of me. This is 1970s, right? So it's a paint in. You know, there's glue in, there's a paint in, you know, there's probably all sorts of other things, teach in, who, who knows. And this is me responding to some abstract work that I'd seen in the art show that, that, it, that was nearby, which horrified me because everybody at the age, well, not everybody, I was an art teacher for a while, but I was horrified by the idea that you could just put flowers on canvas. But if you look at it, I think it does have some resemblance to it, so called a or whatever it's called, it's kind of a bleak. Um, so I'm just kind of chronologically going through here. I spent some time in New York City um, and started working with assemblage. This is probably about 25 years old at this point. Uh, and mostly it was found objects found in the trash in Brooklyn when I was living there and then putting things together, but starting to use light as a media, medium. Uh, about five years later, uh, this was actually installed here in the studio center in the gallery, maybe five years later, probably about 10 years later. Uh, flashlights, wires, you name it. Um, okay, and then starting to think about flight so this was one of my first things that I did with flight just in, in the woods, I'd say it's at a secret location, but it's in Eden basically at my, my house. And these are obviously parachutes with bottles, a little bit cliche, but that's what it is. Um, this is a, um, a portal that I, was, that I did out in the woods. So the idea is just, I like doing random things that nobody's ever gonna see with the idea that some random hunter is gonna walk through the woods and come across this weird thing in the woods. Um, so anyway. Um, I put this in here because a lot of people ask me, why rockets? Well, I can blame that on my parents because like a lot of people, I, I was born around the time of the, the space flight just after the, the first landing on the moon. And I can remember having a Fisher Price record player, which probably didn't look, I remember it being a little different than this, but I had a record of the first moon landing, you know, the, the Neil Armstrong and that kind of stuff, which I, in, these were in the days where you didn't have very many records. So I probably listened to that over and over again. So, you know, I, I think initially I started making these, uh, these objects, these rockets. So here's a rocket that I did um, uh, for the exposure at the Helen Day Art Center about 10 years ago, probably. Um, and, you know, I just think it was coming from somewhere in my subconscious. Uh, this particular piece, uh, as some of you may recall, is the one that was stolen. So somebody, I had it hanging in a tree next to, the, next to Route 100 coming out of Stowe. 
with a parachute hanging behind it and somebody in broad daylight ripped it off. And the headline was rocket stolen, which then was this headline that got picked up by the national news media. And then the rocket was returned. Um, so I like to say, and I got all this free attention, right? I like to say that, that if you want to, if you're going to be a crime victim, that's the way to go. Um, so in any case, and I, and for, for a couple of years afterwards, I know Helen Day was trying to think about ways they might get the same kind of publicity for their show. Um, but I'm not willing to do that again. It was a little bit stressful. Um, another flying machine in my garage uh, that actually, a lot of things, Studio Center has been so important in my life that this actually at one point ended up in, right in the gallery, right in front of where I am right now. Um, and I, I tried to include a lot of things from the Studio Center. So this is a, this is a residency that I did here. Um, donkeys, uh, well, I guess ass, I can say that I guess my parents are on the call, but they can plug their ears. Um, and you know, dirigibles or whatever they are. Um, this one's kind of an apology to the Shelburne Museum. Uh, they wanted a rocket for a show. This is what I gave them. Um, it's much smaller than it should have been. So if you've ever seen uh, Spinal Tap, where they have the Stonehenge model, where they have this tiny little Stonehenge model and the band comes out, that's kind of what this was. It was in the rockets and steampunk exhibit that they had there years ago. And um, I, I always kind of felt bad because it was too small. But anyway. Uh, Another one at the Studio Center. So this is the same rocket from before, after I like left in the woods for five years for the hunters to come across. Um, I put this one together, reworked it, and you're gonna see this come back later because I think that one of the best, thing, best things you can do with artwork is to work with time, you know, rust, decay, all those kinds of things that happen simply by leaving something outside. Um, this is my daughter standing in front of another rocket. Uh, I'll just kind of keep going through some of these. Of course, the posed selfie kind of thing. Um, I can't remember exactly when I did this, but I, we, we were working with an artist here the, from the Studio Center, and I think she assigned my students a project on metaphor. I think this was, I think both of these actually came out of that assignment, uh, from what I remember. So Marilyn Montefiore, if you ever watched this, this these are ones that, that were done as a result of you being in our classroom. Okay. Flight. I didn't catch that this was a flight image until I looked at it years later. Uh, my daughter came home from a birthday party, or my son with, uh, with a balloon, and um, this is what came out of that. All right. Um, because I made that tiny rocket years before, I felt like I needed to actually go back and rebuild one that was a little bit bigger. So it's a welding shot. And this is what came out of it. Um, this is at the Kent Museum. If anybody has ever been to the Kent Museum, you know what an amazing place it is. If you haven't been to the Kent Museum, especially in the fall when they have their big show, you absolutely have to go. Um, and I, I know I've seen some of you there and lots of you have exhibited there. So the rocket that we saw at Real Artways, this is the same one, but it's closed on top. Um, and so that rocket easily becomes a missile. And that's basically what it is here. And I think that one of the things I'm playing around with is this idea of you know, this playful rocket, toy, whatever, that can quickly become a missile. And for the record, um, if anybody knows David, um, the curator for the state of Vermont, I pointed this at his house. So this, this missile was pointed right at his house, which is down the road, uh, which I think we, and we went back and forth on Facebook for quite a while um, about that. Uh, another, another shot, this is um, sitting on top of um, Chris Miller's uh, rock sculpture, uh, but I built both the rocket there and the, uh, the little building that there, that's there is the Missile Re Research Control Station um, that is intended to kind of uh, support that rocket somehow. Okay, and then this is, I, I took this image actually after I'd taken the rocket down about 15 minutes before I disassembled the um, the building, but um, I think it's the best shot that I got of it. I wish I'd gotten the whole thing when the fog had rolled in. And if you've ever been to Calais, I mean, that is just a beautiful location. And I, I was fortunate enough because I had to move this building several times and take it apart and do different things. Well, not all at that one place, but I spent a lot of time at the Kent Museum and really enjoyed it. Okay, another project. This was the beginning of the Vermont Museum of Contemporary Art and Design. And again, what I said before was, I just decided to come up with the most pretentious name that I could think of for an art gallery. Um, and this was it, it was a, started as a four foot by four foot building, seven days, uh, wrote an article yesterday where they said, I think fairly nice things about me. Uh, this was compared to an outhouse and I think that's an appropriate, um, appropriate thing of, uh, way of looking at it. it. It's about the size and shape. Um, and basically the idea was that artists could come in and they could have a solo show. You could drive up, called drive-by solo shows. You put your artwork in the gallery, and then you can claim that you had something at the Vermont Museum of Contemporary Art and Design. I'd give you a, a you know a title if you wanted it, and you could put that on your resume. Um, so that kind of evolved. Here's here's just you know one example of it. Kind of things being added on. 
um, different ways of looking at it. And then I started making miniature artwork in part because I had a small studio at the time. I sense of a much nicer studio, which means that I can make things bigger, but these are, these are tiny. Um, so they're, uh, you know, maybe an inch tall, that, that orange thing. This was actually the nose of a snowman that um, my mother-in-law had given to my kids, a snow, you know, like a snow person kit. This snowman's kind of a sexist way of doing it. But anyway, and then I decided that the problem with Eden, Vermont, if anybody has ever been to Eden, that most people, no offense to Eden, okay, it's a nice place, but there aren't a lot of reasons to go there other than, of course, the Vermont Museum of Contemporary Art and Design. So I decided I need a mobile museum. I needed to bring the art to the people. And I found this camper on a hillside in Montgomery, and it had been in the woods for so long that trees had to be cut down to get it out. And it had been filled with animals. And my kids still talk about the smell on the inside of it. And I had to tell you, and I, I had no idea what I was doing. So I hauled this thing home. I was so proud of this idea. I think I might even have a picture of that. Well, anyway, and I spent basically a year rebuilding this thing because it was so rotten. Don't ever do that. I mean, I've built buildings before and I've never taken on a construction project that was as awful as this one was. But this is eventually what came out of it. So it's this tiny little camper filled with artwork. And this is an example of one of the galleries on the inside of, of the museum. So um, all of those little wooden floorboards, if you can imagine, you know, like a quarter of an inch wide, you can't go buy, uh, well, maybe you could for dollhouse stuff, but you can't buy the pieces to make a miniature museum. Um, and you can actually see that little piece of artwork, the, one of the first things that I made in the background to the left-hand side there. Okay, um, that room that we were just looking at is in the center left with something else installed in it. And this is just the front of the camper. So there are, there are galleries all around. I know a lot of you have seen it, so I won't, won't talk too long about it. Um, more miniature artwork. These are uh, drill filings. So if you drill through plastic, if you've ever done that, this is what comes out of it. This came out of the dumpster at Leo's Welding. And I really didn't do much to it other than take a photograph of it on a small uh, pedestal. Okay, and these are just, rather than show you 100 more images, uh, a composite shot of lots of the miniature artwork that I made. And I, I worked on this for, for several years. So it, you know, I, the, the actual miniature museum was, was faster than, but miniature artwork, I guess, in general. Uh, so anyway, more small stuff, more small stuff, small. <laughs> okay, you get the basic idea here. Um, I'm just gonna go through some of these kind of quickly. I do like working with metal, I particularly like aluminum. Uh, paper crimpers and aluminum are fun. Uh, City Hall in Montpelier. Kent Museum. So I think I'm the only one that's been there three years in a row, but twice I was only there for a day. Uh, so I, I, I went there twice before they let me have a show at the museum. Uh, Fairbanks Museum. And this is my favorite, favorite shots of it. Some of you may recognize this. Uh, the other thing that Eden Vermont is known for is the asbestos mine that we have. It was one of the largest mines in North America um, and is now abandoned. It's an amazing place, uh, but I set up there. Um, and there were, believe it or not, kids playing in the creek right behind there. Um, and people came out. I think I might even have an, an image of somebody, you know, one of the guys coming out. Been, they were actually very kind. It was just a lot of fun. Um, I was up there with another artist the other day, though. And, and if you drive up there now, they, they, they had a, a dog that came out that was not vicious, but looked vicious. It was a pit bull and it was actually very, fairly friendly. But uh, be careful if you go up there. You can see the tailing piles right behind it if, if you look at millions of tons of waste rock. Okay, Museum of Everyday Life, if you've never been there, one of my favorite places in the world again. Okay, and then this, of course, is the world headquarters of the Vermont International Museum of Contemporary Art and Design. Oh, and by the way, I added the word international to the name of the museum because, at least in theory, uh, the museum could drive over the border into Canada. So that makes it international. I've only really been in Vermont with it, but no, we're, we're not, you know, you can smell the Canadian air when we're here. We get weather from Canada, so it's international. Um, so Vermont International Museum of Contemporary Art and Design. This is the world headquarters. I don't know if I said that already, but we've got the original four by four. And of course, if you build a camper museum in Eden, Vermont, where we get like 18 feet of snow every year, you have to then build a shed to put your museum under. So it then turned into another big job. Okay. Uh, Fleming Museum contact, well, I, maybe I, contact, I contacted them. So anyway, um, one of the things that I, I, I realized is that the camper is a pretty big thing to haul around. Um, so they were having a miniature show and I found this refrigerator by the side of the road and you know, what am I going to do with it? I turned it into a miniature museum. Um, and the idea behind this one kind of like this show is that it was participatory. So anybody in the gallery could take things 
and move them around, curate their own shows. There were, of course, rules that you had to follow when you were doing that. Like you had to wear an identification badge and use gloves and all the things you do in a museum. Uh, use proper lifting techniques so you didn't hurt yourself. Um, and that was up for so anyway, that was up for several months. So you can probably spend some more time on it. I also uh, did these suitcase museums, which were the original thing that I brought to the curators when I walked into the museum just to kind of show it off uh, with some of the, the artwork. Um, so these were part of that as well. Okay, this is another, another interior view of one of the miniature museum things. More miniatures. Okay, my parents are on this call, so they'll probably recognize this. This was my childhood fort um, in Grand Rapids, Michigan, which is long gone. There's now a swimming pool there, but um, those ideas like this, the Calder Stabile that I'll, I'll come back to in a little bit, this fort came back later with my own kids. And if they're in this call, they were talking about maybe being here, they do dress like that all the time. That's what they wear. We all kind of dress in that Renaissance fair kind of attire at home, but we just don't do it outside of the house. Okay, setting up some more images with them. Um, and then switching from the funny stuff, this was actually, this is my kidney cancer image. And I don't, didn't really realize that's what it was, but um, I had to have part of a kidney remove, I'm fine now. Um, but I went back later and looked at it and realized, wait, okay, I see what's going on here. I made each of these little wooden pieces uh, when, I was, when I couldn't move around. Um, and I had a, about several week recovery from that. Um, this piece was going to go in a show last year and then two days before the opening, uh, everything closed. The governor closed the state of Vermont. So that I only got studio shots of this, although um, it's, this is at Northern, this is supposed to go to Northern Vermont University in their gallery, I think in August or September of this year. Um, this piece was also made for that. And I thought I was just gonna put it on the shelf. And then Jamie Franklin from the Bennington Museum reached out. Oh, this is another piece from that, that show that, and you can see the same rocket, but 10 years later, all beat up having been outside. Um, so anyway, we've got some images from that, but Jamie reached out, they were having a show in the summer and it ended up on the front of the, the Bennington Museum. The original plan was to have it out on the other side. So it comes way up looking, you can see it from, from Main Street, but the historical or business society decided they couldn't have something with electricity out there. If you've never been to the Bennington Museum, yes, it is right next to the extremely inappropriate Abraham Lincoln sculpture. Um, and if you've never seen it, you could look it up, but I'm not gonna explain to you why it's inappropriate. Um, okay, back to Calder. Um, so Calder, and then if you've ever been to the Shelburne Museum, the Kirk Brothers Circus, I think I like even better than Calder Circus. In fact, I know I like it better than, than that, um, but it's this kind of obsessive, make as many pieces as you can. In this case, it's a guy who was making, I think mostly for himself and his kids. When the pandemic hit, I was stuck at home like the rest of you, everything's closed up. And so what I decided to do is just make these wooden figures. I had a studio full of scrap wood um, and I started making these. And I, my, the, the goal was just to make one of them a day. And so I kept it up for several months. Um, and usually I made more than one, to be honest with you. And so here's just an example of what things looked like in my studio circa maybe May 15th. Um, these are actually on display right now. If anybody is in Amher, uh, uh, Holyoke, Massachusetts, they're in the Paul Holyoke Gallery right now. Most of them, a lot of them are. Um, so here are some examples of some of those. So, and the, the whole idea was, was, sometimes I took a little bit more than a day, but, but mostly uh, working fairly quickly with limited tools and limited expertise. At one point I cut myself, had to get five stitches in the hospital. I still made one of these that day. It was a really bad one, but I made it just to say I could. Uh, all right. Some of these ended up at the Bennington Museum for the Vermont Ut Utopia show. So they're des definitely a dystopian idea of what Vermont might look like in a couple hundred years. Um, okay. And, and these are just things lit on fire. And then around the election, I went back to making some of these again. And so this is, this is, right around election day from what I remember. So this kind of bound, tied up, tense image. Okay. More from around the election day kind of thing. So definitely a different feel from the playful, whimsical side of that. And then I, I just threw these, these images in uh, to show you kind of an example of the chaos of my studio. Cause I, I think that that's an important piece for me that element of play chaos, whatever it is. And there we go, another one from the studio. And I think that's all I have. Woo! 
<laughs> Thank you. That was amazing. Stop, stop sharing for a minute. See if there are any questions from anybody. Uh, yeah, so if anyone wants to shout out a question, go ahead and unmute yourself and do that or write something in the chat. Um, I have a question. I'll start if that's all right, since- Absolutely. Um, except for maybe the pieces that you just showed, the ones that you've made in this pandemic, as opposed to another pandemic, um, it seems like maybe a lot of your work, or at least I used to think this, it seems like a lot of your work requires some kind of maintenance, you know, like whether you're dealing with light or you're dealing with um, things that get weathered or you're dealing with, I'm not really sure, uh, other things, but it, it's come up in my mind, this idea that it's almost like you need to check on it or you need to take care of it or something like that. Do you feel like, am I making that up or is that kind of a part of your work? Yeah, but it's a burden, I think, sometimes, right? Yeah. So I don't know. I, there isn't a huge market for 400-pound, 11-foot rockets. Right. And so I can leave it in my studio, and then I've got to, you know, crawl over it every time I want to get to something, or I have to find somewhere else for it. Um, and so what usually happens is I keep things inside for a while until they're not as precious anymore, and then they end up out with the, you know, the, the misfit sculpture right. And by the way, for some reason, I keep ending up in shows that are called Misfit. I think that <laughs> somebody's saying the show in, in Holyoke is called Misfits. There's a group on Facebook that people, people have posted my stuff to. It's called Misfits. Oh. But I, I have like that, that island of Misfit sculpture. And we have about 13 acres uh, up the road in Eden. So um, plenty of space for it. But oftentimes, the lack of maintenance is what makes things more interesting. But right. yeah, I mean, there's a fragility to it. And I think we get kind of sometimes over caught up in the idea that something has to last for 400 or 500 years. Whereas a lot of my work, I don't think will. And some of it, some of it really only exists for a fraction of a second in the photograph that I'm taking it. You know, like when the, when the fog comes in at the, at the Kent Museum. Yeah, cool. I like that. Any burning questions? Come on people, <laughs> burning questions. Um, how did you get the glowy feel in the portal? The glowy feel? Yeah. Fire. A lot of times I use uh, electric light or, or, or that kind of stuff, but I literally lit a little fire in there for that particular photograph. Um, I think what I was using before, and I, I used it in, a, in, a, in the, one of the rockets that was out by Route 100, the one that was stolen, and one of the Sheldon Museums, I take those traffic lights, I don't know if you've seen the flashing ones that go for like months and they flash, and I put those inside of it. And so I think I had that there originally, but I didn't like the um, I didn't like the way that it looked for the photograph. So I, I lit something on fire inside of it. It was like it's an old a grate on the outside of it. It's so like a portal cover kind of thing. Wow. <laughs> uh, let's I'm seeing see. some questions. Did I register a trade name? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. You did register it. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. No. I <laughs> Uh, I'd be happy to loan it to anybody who'd like to use it, um, if, if you'd like to. I, I don't think there'd be a lot of brand. It's a long, long word to say. I usually have to actually like read it off of something when I'm going back and forth with it. That's awesome. How many people have uh, shown in that museum? So there's a, so some people here might actually have shown in that museum. So there's a permanent collection in the museum. It's actually um, a drawer in the museum and people can just put things into it and then they can say they have it they have work in the traveling international exhibition at the Vermont oh. International Museum of Contemporary Design that's usually the line that I use with like six-year-olds and I, I tell them that um, you know that's what this, that's going to get them into college and get a scholarship um, so yeah lots of lots of jokes and I, I kind of stopped doing the museum tours for a while because I felt like I saw the same jokes over and over so if you've already heard these jokes my apologies to you um, here, I'll read this one. Do you name your pieces? And if so, uh, when you rework them, do you rename them? Oh, yeah. Well, so names are hard for me. Um, and if, if anybody was paying again attention to my Instagram feed about three or four weeks ago, I was trying to come up with a name for this show. Um, Arista can tell you that we've even when we've done shows, we've used those artist name generator shows for the titles of things. You know, I really, you know, I, I struggle with names of things more than just about anything. And, but because of that, if I have something that I don't like, then I, then I will rename it. And sometimes the, the name becomes apparent years later, as I'm sure a lot of you have happened, where 
you make something and you think it's about something or you think it's about nothing and then you realize that, oh, wait a minute, this was that, that event, that thing, that time, that emotion. Um, and I think that's actually more common for me than not. So, um, mm -hmm. and I, I guess I worry a little bit though that names, names don't allow people to have their own interpretation um, of the work. And I, I guess I'd rather have that than give them, you know, this is what things are about, so. Hmm. Uh, are the color pieces with magnet attachments, is that one piece for this show? So each, I, I want to know, I, I, may, I may be misunderstanding the question, but um, there are lots of pieces. So if you looked at it in my studio, my studio walls are 12 feet high. And so I went much larger, but they're, they're modular. So you can take them in pieces and put them together in lots of different ways. Mm -hmm. um, and the studio center though, I think they're eight and a half foot tall ceilings. Is that about right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and so I, I completely rearranged things when I came in here, which meant that I was basically in here for, uh, for a weekend. I was in here a lot trying to think about where everything was going to go. So yeah, every, and the, honestly, the camper museum is the same way that um, imagine taking your living room and shaking it up for an hour, right? That's the same thing that happens every time that I move any work. Um, yeah. So it does change things. Uh, someone says, I love the playful nature of your work. For someone who makes interactive art, uh, times like these can be tough. Do you find comfort in making crowds of wooden figures in times when people cannot gather? Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, um, I don't know if I feel comfort because I'm surrounded. I mean, that'd be kind of interesting if like these were my company, right? If I were talking to little figures as I'm making them. <laughs> I'm not sure that that's what you're asking. Um, but, I, you know, I, I think a lot of people really struggled with the initial part of the lockdown. And for me, it just felt like an extended artist residency. I, I had more time and less distraction, I think, than I've ever had. Um, I've, I've been able to maintain a lot of contact with people because I'm also teaching. Um, and so I'm constantly doing what we're doing right now, which is, you know, somewhat artificial, but still satisfies that. Um, but it, it is kind of fun, truthfully, to get these things out and start moving them around in a very playful way and posing them. I know that I just sent, I sent down just two boxes that were jammed full of these things. I mean, I don't know how many of them I sent to, uh, to Paul Polyoak and Dean, who, who runs that gallery expressed that he had a lot of fun unpacking things and then just kind of playing with them. So yeah, they keep me company a little bit. Um, yeah. Uh, have you ever come into the gallery and seen lots of pieces changed around? Here? No. At the, um, no. At, <laughs> I mean, Kristen, you probably know that, that there is not, uh, you know, there are not people beating down the doors. They're not beating down the doors quite, but. Yeah. <laughs> Well, after this, I'm convinced that after they hear me talk tonight. I mean, gonna there's going to be a line tonight, probably. That's yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I see people lining up. Outside. <laughs> um, you know, I think that, I think that, first of all, there are people driving by all, all the time. And this is, I'm kind of off topic here. Um, but that's what I like about this kind of work that people who wouldn't normally be in a gallery are able to see the gallery. Um, and, and they don't have any choice. I'm inflicting myself upon everybody that drives by and I'm, I'm sure I'm scarring them for a long time. No, it's good. It's good. Yeah, so I don't know. So Ed, as far as, uh, let me see if I, have I answered that question? I think I went off topic a bit. I, I think so. I think if it weren't a pandemic, you would find things moved around. I just oh, think yeah. because, you know, only a few people come in at a time. It's, you know, it's different. It's not like all willy nilly. It's, you know, people are like, oh, it's just me and so-and-so in here. And, well, and I also know that I have to come back at some point and repair the walls here. So I didn't put it in with giant bolts to make it super, right? Whereas at the Fleming Museum, when I had the refrigerator, we had to really think about how people are going to be interacting with it because a lot of them were two, three years old. Um, and that piece was constantly changing. I mean, and it was like, sometimes you walk in and it was brilliant. You loved what you saw. And other times it was like, wow, what were they thinking, right? Um, which is hard as an artist because you want your stuff to look really good. And sometimes it doesn't. So to, to give up that control... I think it's really hard, mm -hmm. but I like the idea oh, well. of being able to come in and participate. Um, someone said that they, uh, that the little wooden figures bound with fabric make them think of totems, which is kind of cool. Uh, the next question is, it seems like both happens. Um, I'm thinking it's from something earlier about comfort and uh, making your own little friends. Uh, I'm wondering how much of the time the idea is there first or does the material you have available inspire or birth the piece? Sorry, I, I think both. I mean, to be honest with you, some of my work is very spontaneous. I think, especially for the um, 
the the small wooden figures. It was just take, take a piece of wood, cut it into something, see what happens. Um, and other things are very intentional. So I, I think it just it it really depends on the piece. But I'm I, I tend to be a pretty spontaneous um, person. I don't I'm not good. I'm not patient with planning things out weeks, months in advance. Although I do keep a sketchbook and I'm constantly coming up with ideas. Um, yeah. I don't know if I answered that question. And as far as totems, yeah, I think so, right? Yeah. Maybe it's like Donald Trump and I'm sticking needles into him or something like that. Yeah. Have you ever, this is my own question, have you ever uh, created your own game? Like a board game or not a mind game? Yeah. Like yeah. A, you know, like, a, yeah, something. That's actually a really good question. So when I was an undergraduate, um, I did my, I think my senior thesis or, the, or maybe the year before that on the idea of creativity as a, as a game, right? And I'd create these, you know, as, kind of a pretentious art student thing to do. I'd like to come, come in with this like infinite game that has no whatever it is and tell my classmates during critique that they have to play this game. And then I'd leave the room for 10 minutes. I can remember doing that at one point and writing papers about it and different things. So yeah, I think that... Um, I don't know that I ever read, actually read the book, but I read the back cover of it. So I think that counts. But the idea of finite versus infinite games, I worked in bookstores for years. So I read lots of back covers books. Mm -hmm. um, but the idea of, you know, a finite game, you're trying to win, you're trying to end the game, you're trying to move on and an infinite game where you just keep playing. If anybody's ever played, I know my dad's and you play golf or something like that, you can never win, right? There's never, there's never a perfect, I guess it could be 18, right? Uh, 18 holes in one in a row. I mean, that's the way that art is. Uh, that's the way that teaching is. That's the way that parenting is. I mean, it's, you know, it's, these, it's this humbling thing. And that's more interesting to me than a finite game I want to win kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But I could also see those little figures ending up as game pieces so I can see that. Yeah. Cool. Your parents aren't asking questions, I don't think. I know. Can you believe it? <laughs> heard them talk Come on, Bruce. Don't you have a question? <laughs> My guess is they're on a cell phone. They'd have to try to figure oh, out maybe. <laughs> how to type things in in Zoom. Yeah. Uh, here's one. Did you notice the abstract piece you made as a boy shown on an easel looks similar to the interactive show at the Vermont Studio Center? <laughs> so the, we, oh, so is there a show? Is it, uh, there's think, other things that are on it? I think she means the one, you know, that picture with you and it looks like maybe siblings. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That, that easel might look like the work that's behind you, but like those are brushstrokes behind you as if they are. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, I th well, so yeah. And uh, I think that question is from Aura and I think Aura, Aura probably know I've done a lot of teaching um, and worked with little kids and I steal their ideas all the time. And so I, I think I'm stealing my own ideas. I mean, I, I definitely went through that period work that looks like whatever it is um but you get to be my age and i just i love the freedom and color and all that stuff that happens with with younger younger kids i think they make better art a lot of times than adults do um, yeah. but we're i think we're too intentional i agree with that i love stealing ideas from kids <laughs> like <laughs> elementary school kids middle school kids man yeah, yeah totally um yeah and i'm not ashamed so no I, I i admit to it yeah i mean they're brilliant they are uh your students must love you you have such a free art approach yeah so how do your students feel about you that's a good question <laughs> oh you should stop by sometimes I, I especially in june you know when the end everybody's done at the end of the school year um, i'm really fortunate i have a really great group of students um and and we we're incredibly fortunate because we it's a full day, full year art program right now, basically. And they get to, they have, it's really, I'm, I'm fortunate. Wow, that's awesome. I didn't yeah, realize but, it's year round. Well, it's, it's well, it's school year. So, oh, so okay. when school's in session from, from, from August to, to June, they're with me. And it's gotcha. the same group of kids and they get high school and college credit. And so cool. Yep. That's so awesome. Cool. Um, if you could take the International Museum to your dream location, where would that be? Oh, wow. I don't know. You have any ideas for me? I mean, I, I think the problem is it's a 1950s camper, so it's not easy to transport. Uh, I mean, it kind of runs behind my truck. Uh, wow. I don't know. I mean, it, it should be intergalactic, so maybe we put it out into space, you know, like, like Tesla did with the car. But um, 
that's a little too cliche, I think, for somebody that makes rockets. It's a good question, though. Put it on the ticket. <laughs> <laughs> oh, on the rocket. Put it on the rocket. I think it would look really cool parked like right next to the Grand Canyon. There you go. I mean, you don't have to pull it yourself. You could get a truck to drive it out there for you on a flatbed, you know? And I think that's what's been suggested. Um, that, yeah. yeah I mean, I, it would be expensive, but yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, do your students have you for uh, one school year? Yep. One school yeah. year. So they can do two school years if they, some, some occasionally students will come back for a second year, but it's basically a, oh. an art and design program. For a year. Cool. I didn't realize that either. I need to come visit someday when there isn't a pandemic. Oh, drive it to Antarctica. <laughs> yeah, we'll be we'll allowing people in the building. Yeah, that's yeah. true. Uh, here's one. What are you working on next? Taking a nap. I've been really busy for the last little bit. No, I, I, truthfully, I, um, so we're coming up on February break right now. I'm sure I'm going to spend the week in the studio. I actually would like to keep doing, going with the project that we're working on here. Um, some of this is a little bit rough still. Um, if you came in here with, with young kids, some things are sharp and I'd like to figure out a way, um, to make something that truly is able to be interactive. So, mm -hmm. um, in a gallery setting or a museum or something like that, or even just you know, like out and about, and maybe even outdoors. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I really like that idea of, of magnets. Um, and, and I like the idea that you don't immediately, maybe you do immediately look at it and think magnets. It's the idea of moving things around. Mm -hmm. And for someone like me, um, I, I, you know, I started out as a painter and I, I don't think even think I showed any painting in this, but anyway, mm -hmm. um, that idea painting is, you know, I, I make decisions and then I'm unhappy with them with these. I just keep moving around all the time. Mm -hmm. And I do move these around the little figures, not so much, but the magnets, absolutely. And that, that to me is just like, a, it was, it's wonderful. Mm -hmm. that, what's the echo museum? I don't know that. The Echo, so Echo's in, in Burlington. It's the okay. Leahy Echo Center right on, right on Lake Chef Plain. Yeah, okay. I'd love to. Check it out. Yeah. The fridge is magnetic. <laughs> yeah, well, and that, so that's where, the, that's where the magnets came from. So that refrigerator yeah. museum at the Fleming had, yeah. the, the paintings had magnets on them. So you could put the, the paintings inside the museum. And the same thing is true. The Camper, the camper Museum has a, has a fridge in it. And the, there, there are pieces of artwork that I didn't show that attached to the, the fridge. So you just like you have fridge magnets, oh, you have contemporary art and design, miniature, of course. Yeah. There you go. That's awesome. Uh, any last burning questions? I do want to let everyone know that uh, Matt's show was scheduled for the month of February, but it is staying up through the month of March as well, which I'm super excited about. Um, so if you want to come see it in person, you can email, I'll put it here, you can email galleries at, and basically you're emailing me, but I can figure out a time to let you in. Um, but yeah, you have through March 31st. Um, Jill Madden says they're coming to see, that's great. Um, somebody asked, uh, the wooden pieces and the metal magnet pieces make me think of characters. Do you think of narrative in your work as in stories or fiction, or do you think of them more like a stage play? Well, I definitely think of them as a narrative. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know whether or not, I mean, the difference between a stage play and, and I don't know, I guess narrative could be narrative in art, narrative in, in literature, whatever it is. Um, I don't always know the stories. I don't think I focus on the, like coming up with a, a clear narrative, but I, I love the idea that, that they do have a story that they, I mean, I hope that they have some sort of emotion behind them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm going to also post at the end here again, the article that just came out yesterday for anyone who came in late or whatever, the article from seven days talking about this exhibition. Um, supposedly it's a great article. Uh, I haven't read it yet, but I will. <laughs> your name in it too. Did you know that you're listed in there? My name? You're even in bold. Really? <laughs> yeah, really. Yeah. Well, I guess now I'll definitely read it. <laughs> oh, I didn't know that. Um, that's great. That's really great. But um, yeah, I know people are really talking about it and excited about it. And I love that uh, you have made it so dynamic for us to see um, from outside, but especially from dusk. Yeah. Overnight. It's really great. So yeah, see it at night if you can. I think that's the time to see it. 
that's that's what my kids tell me. They they say it's not as good during the day. <laughs> well, you know they know best. <laughs> yeah, and they're honest with me. So yeah, exactly. Well, thank you, Matt. Um, do you have any questions for us? <laughs> No, but thank, thank you so much. I mean, it's just yeah. such a thrill to be here. Um, and, you know, this is always one of my favorite places, as I've said before. Oh, um, thank and, you. And it has once again been wonderful to work with. So, um, good. Yeah. good. Well, we love it so much. So thank you for putting your all into it as you always do. <laughs> but yeah, it's been, it's great. So thank you. And thanks for Excellent. this talk tonight. And if you don't mind, I will edit the beginning and the end, or maybe the beginning with me, take me out, and we'll post it uh, at least on our website, probably sometime next week. And it'll probably hit IGTV at some point too. Great. Cool with that. Okay, great. I'll make sure I tag you in it. So, you know, when it comes out. Wonderful. Awesome. 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 Thank you again, Matt. Thank you. Thanks everybody for, for being here tonight. I appreciate it.